Last year, we took an extensive tour of the Eco Village at Ithaca with its co founder, Liz Walker. Liz graciously took us through the founding of the Eco Village, how it's structured, and what day to day life is like there. The video generated more questions from you, our audience, particularly those of you who are interested in co living and co housing structures. So we took a good portion of your queries and asked some of the residents at the Eco Village to spend some time answering them. These will be multi-part interviews, so be sure to subscribe to the channel if you don't want to miss out when they launch, and feel free to hit the notifications button as well. 10% of our Google AdSense proceeds are reinvested back into our community here, and it's being matched by our partners at Espoma Organic. So your views, understanding, and support really do go a long way, even if you're halfway across the world. So Bill, just give me a little bit of your background because we've chatted with you and yep. graciously. And what's your background and what's your relationship with uh, the Ithaca Eco Village? Well, my background is I was an attorney for many years. I'm now retired, but um, I came here to Eco Village first about 20 years ago um, to check it out when I was thinking about moving to Ithaca from Buffalo. I grew up outside of Syracuse. I lived and practiced in Buffalo for many years. But when I wanted to move back to central New York, come to the Finger Lakes area, I had known about Eco Village for a number of years um, back in the 90s when they were um, creating it and starting the first neighborhood frog. So I came here to check it out and I was really captured by the beauty and the concept and the vision of the place. So I got involved in the second neighborhood song, which was developing at that time. And so then um, I started to get involved in helping out with some of the legal work we had other counsel, other attorneys in Ithaca working for Song as well, but I helped out with that. And so I got to know a lot about the, the legal structures here and uh, then helped Tree out too when Tree was forming. And then just a year ago, I moved from my unit in Song over to Tree. So I now, now live in the third neighborhood here. And when you started to learn about like kind of the legal structures here, was mm. it something that you were familiar with before or that you can navigate just because you're in law or is it something that you had to really orient yourself to? Um, it, it wasn't something that I was familiar about before because it's quite a unique um, legal setup here um, and because of our, our um, you know organizational structures as a cooperative corporation. Um, I had done house closings before so I had done you know general fairly simple um, real estate transactions for folks who are buying a house but here we own shares in the cooperative corporation, so we don't actually own our houses. By owning shares, we get a, what's called a proprietary lease, which is a long-term lease to give us the right to inhabit our unit. So that, that's a very different type of structure, especially here in upstate New York. Um, Co-ops, of course, are very common in New York City, but, uh, but I'd never had experience with them before, mm -hmm. but just sort of learned as I went along um, working on the development of song. So this is set up as a co-op then? Yes. How does that so, interrelate with the um, the nonprofit part of this, the nonprofit component of this? Um, yeah. So this gets into um, what uh, some some uh, folks and one friend of mine who helped uh, to develop song used to say: um, the path to voluntary simplicity leads through involuntary complexity because of trying to deal with all we have to in terms of interfacing with the rest of the world and all the you know legal and, and insurance and, and financing structures. We first um, created uh, the not-for-profit here, which bought the land. And then the not-for-profit uh, turned over land in little chunks to each neighborhood. Each neighborhood is its own separate corporation. Um, so Frog, when it got uh, started, um, incorporated as a cooperative corporation, which is a, a special type of corporation under New York state law. And then once we were developing Song, and we created a separate cooperative corporation for song, then we realized we needed even another entity to deal with things such as the road, Rachel Carson Way, which is infrastructure that's shared by two separate neighborhoods or, or, or now all three neighborhoods. And so we created um, a, another um, not-for-profit called the Village Association, the Eco Village at um, Ithaca Village Association. And, um, so all of us who live here, were all shareholders, um, all of us who, who own our units or own our units as opposed to the um, renters, were shareholders in the corporation, 
plus we're members of the village association <clears throat> and so the village association also deals with our water system our pump house um, which you may have seen we have our own a private pump house next to the town's water tank so we actually have five different corporations up here including the three tree song and yes, frog and okay. including the three neighborhoods okay I guess that makes sense. So if you were to ever do another neighborhood, that would be another uh, yes. it's cooper its own cooperative separate. corporation. Right. Yeah. And as I know Liz mentioned in, in your interview with Liz, <clears throat> you know, one of the reasons for that is to protect people from liability mm -hmm. so that if something um, happens, there's some accident or some lawsuit against one entity, it doesn't involve everyone and, and everyone's assets are not at risk. Right. But we try and, and, and maintain smaller, um, you know, activity groupings to, to insulate us from different risks. So let's simplify this. Say uh, I'm interested, there's a there's an opening in tree, since we're standing in tree, uh -huh. and I want to purchase a home. Uh -huh. How does it work? Just take me so, through. <clears throat> yeah, so we have um, here, we have folks generally sell their shares on their own. Um, so real estate agents don't get involved in the sale process. In the past, there have been one or two times when people have tried to use real estate agents and they don't really understand Eco Village, and so it never has worked out. So people will um, list their, their shares for sale first um, internally through the village, and then um, after a certain uh, seven-day waiting period, then they can advertise um, you know, uh, online. And so generally people um, advertise on our website, on the Eco Village website. And so then folks who are interested in purchasing those shares will contact the seller, the owner directly. And then um, they have to go through a membership process because um, we are set up as a cooperative corporation. Any transfer of the shares has to get approval from the board of directors of the corporation. And so that's what makes us um, a lot different than a, a condo, uh, condo association or condo community. Right. And so because um, you have to get approval from the board of directors, and we all want to make sure that somebody who's buying into the neighborhood, because we do live so closely together and work so closely together, we want to make sure people really understand what they're getting into, you have to go through a membership process. So the membership committee um, has certain steps you need to do in order to learn about the place. And you have to complete all those steps before um, you can actually make a, an offer on purchasing somebody's shares. So is it like a quiz or do you have to like, not, you know, go no. through a bunch of hoops? <laughs> yeah, it, 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 not, not a quiz in, in the sense that you're, you're ever um, actually tested, but there are, there's a checklist. Yeah. So one of the things is you have to attend a certain number of meetings because at least here in, in Tree, we, we use dynamic governance, sociocracy, and then in other neighborhoods they use consensus. You have to attend a certain number of meetings to see how the decision making is done. Mm -hmm. And then you have to um, uh, read uh, some materials about co-housing because each neighborhood is set up as a co-housing neighborhood. And then you have to um, come for a tour. We have uh, you know volunteer tour guides who will give you a tour and explain things about the history of the place. And then you have to, um, if you're able to, of course with COVID and the pandemic, it hasn't always always worked out this way, but if you're able to, you're supposed to send a, spend a certain number of nights here. Hmm. And we have guest rooms in the common house, or there are little um, folks who rent out rooms in their houses as, as B&Bs for people to stay in. And then uh, you have to participate in a work party <clears throat> because one of the, the aspects of a co-housing community is everybody, um, we rely upon you know volunteer efforts from everybody to contribute to community work. And so <clears throat> as a potential um, purchaser, you have to participate in a work party so you can get to learn about our volunteer work system. Yeah, I mean, you're trying it on for size essentially yes. to see whether it's <clears throat> the right kind of fit. And I, I feel like, uh -huh. you know, when I, uh, went to Cornell, there was something called the uh, the Big Red Carpet Society, and you get to stay uh -huh. overnight with students, and you get to go to class, and you get to try it on, and you're like, okay, right. before I actually commit to this, does it actually feel right to me? Yeah. And, you know, does the culture, you know, fit with me too? Because that was a question that people had, you know, uh -huh. how do you know before making the commitment whether it is a right fit? And it seems like you actually have to go through this membership process in order to kind of realize yeah. that. <clears throat> we, gen we generally say that, um, you know, here we let people self-select. Right. Um, we give them as much information as we can so they can learn about us and then decide if this actually is the right place for them or not. Because it's, it's not for everybody. Yeah. And um, But we hope that through the membership process, they can, you know, come to some realization if they really do want to live here or not. Yeah. So it's almost like you said, self-selecting. Uh -huh. It's not necessarily a vetting process per se. It is no. and it isn't, but it's more <laughs> like a self-selecting for that person to see if it's right for him or her and not for necessarily like whether 
you're scrutinizing like you're not right yes. for this. Yes, and, and, and that way we're, we're actually different than many co-ops in New York. So I've had some you know, contact and, and some friends who lives in, in co-ops in New York City where they're more common. Mm -hmm. And their, um, their process is all about finances. Mm -hmm. And you have to submit you know, two years worth of tax returns and two years worth of your bank and brokerage statements to the board of directors because they want to be sure that you're able to pay your maintenance fees to I the co-op. Yeah. And so that's what their vetting process is. I see. So you know, we've got a totally different vetting process. You know, of course, we do want to make sure that people can um, you know, maintain their uh, maintenance bills every yeah. month. Yeah. But we don't put as much emphasis on the financial vetting that, that a traditional co-op in New York City would do. I see. And so, you know, you had mentioned that this is a cooperative corporation and you also mentioned like a condo association, homeowners association. Yeah. What are the different, you know, structures you can do for a co-housing community if it's not a cooperative corporation? Well, most that I know about, and, and I should say, um, you know, there aren't a lot in New York State. Um, and, and I have, you know, been in touch with some of them in the past and then I've read about others in other states. And um, of course, you know, the, the co-op law that I'm familiar with is New York state law, so I'm not sure um, how that works in every state. It's, it's always different. But um, most that I know of are actually set up as condos, condo associations. And so in there, you actually get a deed to your house. So you actually, it's considered you own the real estate mm -hmm. for the um, interior of your structure, interior of your unit. And um, that, uh, that is, is a lot different because there still is a, a corporation, the, the condo association is a corporation, and um, so it does have a board of directors, um, but it doesn't have quite as much control over the transfer of units, mm -hmm. and um, also it doesn't, and, and, you know, doesn't have as much control over um, sort of the, the social interactions among the members. So in a traditional co-housing community, community, you know, they, they try and foster that um, interaction uh, because of their um, design and their intentions. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> but in terms of the legal structure, the legal structure doesn't force them to have as much connection as a cooperative corporation would, would force them to have. Okay. And then you could probably do things like an LLC as well. And, and <clears throat> yeah. yeah. And, and so in terms of um, eco-villages, there, there are probably some eco villages that are, are set up as LLCs, mm -hmm. um, and uh, I don't know of, of many co-housing neighborhoods that mm -hmm. would be set up that way, just because of um, the complications that you get into when you have an LLC of having um, individual mortgages on mm -hmm. units, mm -hmm. um, because in an LLC, people are members of a, of an LLC, but it would be difficult for most banks, I think, to be able to lend money to a particular individual mm -hmm. to buy a membership share in an LLC. Right. Whereas they are set up because, because you know, condos and, and cooperative corporations are, are, you know, creatures of state law. Mm -hmm. um, the banks and financing institutions are set up to loan people money in order to buy their, either their deed in their condo or the shares in their cooperative. Mm -hmm. So they, it is, people can get a loan in, in, in order to buy their... And the nonprofit it. element of Eco Village could uh -huh. it have been set up sort of like a community land trust per se? <clears throat> yeah, actually, um, in a sense, we do have uh, an element of a community land trust here. Um, a lot, lot of folks here, um, you know, m might not be. It's not at the top of their mind because most folks don't pay as much attention to the legal details as I do. But Song, the second neighborhood actually um, did not uh, get title to the land it sits on from the EVI Inc. not-for-profit. Mm -hmm. It got a 99-year lease, um, which is renewable. So at the end of 99 years, they can renew it for another 99 years. So in that sense, the EVI Inc. not-for-profit actually still owns the land that Song is sitting on. I see. Um, it's not that case with Frog and Tree, um, the not-for-profit actually transferred title to the land that the, those two neighbors sit on. But because of um, some of the way we were doing the initial financing of song construction, and we had gotten some uh, loan from a, um, a community land trust um, foundation that, that uh, promotes community land trusts, we set up song in that way. So in that sense, we do have a land trust model here at Eco Village. And what are the things that you could 
you know, you have to, you think if somebody's setting something up, whether it's a co-housing or cooperative association, whatever it might be, what are some of the things that you, you feel like, especially coming from your legal background, that you must do right from the beginning? And what are the things that you could skimp on and say, ah, I could handle that later? Because, and, and the reason why I ask that is because mm -hmm. we have gotten a lot of folks reach out to us and, and kind of say, oh, we don't know what kind of structure you want to do yet. And they, they want to kind of put the cart before the horse, so to speak. So mm -hmm. what are the things that you would advise, you know, coming from your legal background? Yeah, I, I would advise that you create some structure at least. And, and this is actually um, how we've done things here at Eco Village in the past. Um, and, and during the development stage, you should at least have, um, well, when we were doing uh, song development, we created what we call a joint venture, which is like a um, kind of like a partnership, a specialized type of partnership. So everybody signs an agreement. You have a joint venture agreement that governs how decisions are made and how finances are handled, which are you know two of the key things you want to make sure you get clear about and everybody signs a joint venture agreement. So they all become partners in this development entity. Mm -hmm. Then in, in Tree, we had the joint venture, but then also at some point um, created an LLC for Tree. And so that serves basically as the legal entity that, that is responsible um, and can interface with the outside world um, in terms of the development process. And that, that gives some protection to people and, and some you know, oversight about how their monies are being handled that, that they put into the venture. Mm -hmm. um, so, so I definitely recommend creating some type of structure. Um, and then you can, you can do activities with that um, entity until you figure out whether you're gonna be a condo or a co-op or not-for-profit or some other type of um, long-term entity. Got it. Yeah. Then going back to the shares, mm -hmm. Say you have a, a space, you own the shares, uh, somebody unfortunately passes away. Can you mm -hmm. have bequeathed those shares to somebody within your family? And then how does that family member, do they just own the shares? And what if they don't fulfill the membership so, criteria? Yeah. So that's, that's the, um, the interesting thing about the cooperative model that, that we've chosen here. And I think that's probably one of the reasons it was originally chosen. Um, I, wasn't, I haven't been around since the very creation. I got involved as a, 20 years ago. So I wasn't around 30 years ago mm -hmm. when they started everything here. But, but with a cooperative model, then the shares um, are an asset of your estate. So you're your heirs, your, your beneficiaries um, uh, can get uh, a benefit of them. But because of our, our rules about who can move in, they can't necessarily move in until they complete the membership process. So usually, uh, unless, you know, unless the heirs really wanted to, to live here and go through the membership process, they would, um, the estate would probably put the shares on the market to sell them. I see. And then the estate would get the funds and then distribute that to the beneficiaries. Okay. But, but if, yeah, if, if somebody's heir, you know, their child or something did want to move in, they would have to go through the membership process before they could move in. Okay. And then what are the, the fees of actually moving into the different villages? Do the different villages have different fees and are you paying into the fees for make sure there's snow removal on Rachel Carson Way, for instance? Yeah, so the, the basic fees that we pay are a monthly maintenance fee. And so there's, um, we get uh, one monthly invoice um, each month, but there are, are a, a number of sets of fees. So some are related to your particular neighborhood. And so those are the fees for uh, maintaining all the structures in the neighborhood. It might include capital reserves for um, saving up money to make repairs in the future on the structures. And a big portion of, of it is your share of the real estate taxes. Because everything is owned by a co-op, we get one real estate tax bill for the entire neighborhood. Oh, I see. And then we split that up amongst everybody based upon the number of shares they have, mm -hmm. which is roughly related to the size of their unit. So larger, um, larger units would pay a greater proportion, smaller units would pay a smaller share. So that's a big, um, uh, uh, that and also the insurance that the co-op has on the structures is a big portion of your monthly bill. Mm -hmm. Then also there's monthly um, charges from the village association I mentioned before, mm -hmm. the, the uh, corporation we created to deal with common infrastructure. So anything related to Rachel Carson Way, our private road, or our pump house and our water system, um, those are all village expenses. And so we split those up amongst everybody, all 100 units. Um, that are here, and uh, those appear on your monthly maintenance bill as well. And so those can vary from, um, 
like I have one of the smaller units here, I have a studio unit. And so uh, the monthly maintenance on that is about $450 mm -hmm. um, a month. And then the largest units in some of the neighborhoods might go up to about uh, a little over $900 a month okay. for their monthly maintenance Got it. costs. Now, last time we spoke, and you don't have to share this, but last time we spoke, you were thinking about doing, uh, you know, kind of a, a little co-housing unit with nine of your friends. Did that ever pan out? Uh, yes, yeah. I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't quite call it co-housing, um, but I'm actually going up there uh, later today. It's like a vacation kind of, yeah. Yeah, it's, yeah. it's um, so there's, there's actually now 10 of us. We, we've, we uh, admitted another um, friend in uh, last summer, and uh, we now have uh, three platform tents set up. Uh, so I'm actually going to spend a, a night up there in my platform tent tonight that's, with my that's little great. camping wood stove. And then how did you structure it? Was, is it an... So that's an LLC. Uh, that's an LLC, yeah. okay. And, and that's because we don't, uh, we're never going to be getting any loans or mortgages on that. Yeah. Um, you know, we're just paying cash to put up our little uh, platform tents. And of course, yeah. we couldn't get a loan on a platform tent anyway. Yeah. <laughs> and also... The bank um, is like, what is this? <laughs> yeah. And, and also when we, um, you, you know, at some point in the future when we decide we're getting too old or we're not going to use it anymore, we're probably going to donate it to some... Um, uh, something like the Finger Lakes Land Trust or some Got some um, land conservancy organization. So we're yeah. never going to be selling it. Stay tuned for more of your questions answered in some future episodes, and we'll see you in the next video.